Catherine, Duchess of Kent. You'll have a photograph, which will be nice, yeah? Fiercely proud of her roots. Her Royal Highness is, of course, a popular Yorkshire figure herself. And best known as the Royal at Wimbledon, whose kindness to runners-up won her millions of admirers. Catherine devoted four decades to public service and was an inspiration to royals who followed. She represents the best of the royals. She is the perfect ambassador for the British royal family. After marrying into the family 60 years ago, I, Catherine Lucy Mary, take the Edward. Royal life has come at a cost. From those who doubted she was good enough. There was a lot of opposition to uh, the marriage at first. To a strained early married life. Catherine was effectively an army wife, and I think that meant quite long spells away from her husband. And with events that led to depression, which nearly ended the marriage. I'm told that Catherine had thought about seeking a divorce. This was a lady who'd been put through the ringer. Catherine withdrew from public duties and shunned her royal title. The fact that she stepped back without making a big song and dance about it, she's a bit of a royal pioneer. She's challenged royal convention throughout her marriage, from converting to Catholicism to taking on a secret new role. I learnt more from these children than I ever, ever taught them. Beloved by the public and the good causes she supports, how has Catherine succeeded where so many royals have failed? At an age when most people would be forgiven for putting their feet up, she just keeps going on. The 8th of June, 1961. The wedding day of Prince Edward, the Duke of Kent, a dashing young soldier, with Catherine Worsley, the daughter of a Yorkshire aristocrat who was proud of her northern roots. Just having that wedding in 1961 at York Minster was a royal first. Uh, nobody from the royal family had been married there in over 600 years. And this was very much a nod to Catherine's Yorkshire roots. She's very proud of the fact she comes from Yorkshire and from the north. The Queen and her family travelled up on a special train for the landmark event, while the young Princess Anne was among Catherine's bridesmaids. The local media dubbed this as the White Rose Wedding. And indeed it was. Even uh, the Queen had uh, the White Rose of York as part of a tribute to the setting. Just under 12 million viewers tuned in to watch the afternoon ceremony. And it was one of the highest rating programs of the week in half the nation's homes. At a time when the UK had... Take thee, Edward. To my wedded husband. To my wedded husband was just one small hitch, not seen on camera, as the newly married couple made their exit. After they'd signed the registers, the veil got caught on the step of the altar, and she felt it pull and stood absolutely still until it was released. Otherwise, the veil would have come off and uh, the diamond bandeau tiara that she was wearing that had once belonged to Queen Mary would have come crashing to the floor. No Duchess composed and smiling, unruffled even when her train gets caught up. Catherine made her mark from the word go. She was the first untitled woman to marry into the royal family for more than a century. As this 1961 tabloid reveals, it was front page news that the Duke of Kent was to marry a Yorkshire lass. It did break with tradition, this idea that although she was the daughter of a baronet, that she wasn't royal herself. And that was breaking boundaries and um, changing things. She's definitely upper class. She had no title, but her, her parents had a title, and it was clearly a love match. And she was quite clearly a sweet girl, and that was how she was portrayed. Marrying into the firm had not been Catherine's long-term ambition, but she went on to embrace the royal family on her terms. From an early age, her biggest passion was music, as she explained in a revealing interview on Desert Island Discs. Well, I hoped music would be my life. I don't think I had any other real ambitions at that time. So I get very emotional about music and was very sad to slowly have to give it up. The story of the aspiring music teacher who put her career on hold to be a royal began on the 22nd of February, 1933. She was born Catherine Worsley at Hovingham Hall near York. Her father was Sir William Worsley, fourth baronet. The Worsley family have owned the estate for 
more than 400 years and remain there to this day. Catherine's background was certainly aristocratic and she lived quite an idyllic existence um, at the family estate in Yorkshire. As these charming family photographs reveal, the young Catherine found plenty of play areas within the extensive grounds of the Hobbingham estate. But her childhood was solitary because her three older brothers were away at prep school during term times. Catherine was very close to her father, very fond of him. Catherine talks about how, as a child, he would often take her to the beach at Scarborough and there would indulge with her playing on the sands. Catherine went to school from the age of 10, first at St Margaret's, then based at the stately Castle Howard close by her home. But when she was 13, she went to music. She learned to play three instruments, piano, organ and violin. She hoped that music would be her life. She studied it until she was 25 and she absolutely adores it, even to this day. Another family photo shows Catherine in her 20s, glancing coyly to one side showing signs of the shyness she'd carry throughout her life and which she later described with characteristic modesty. Would you say you're quite a shy person? Yeah. Very, actually. It's my nature. It's the way I was born. By the 1950s, Catherine was living and working in London as a nursery assistant. She was also courting a war hero, Andrew Burnaby Atkins, awarded two military crosses for bravery in World War II. Andrew Burnaby Atkins, whom I knew slightly, was an incredibly glamorous figure, but the girls I knew who were keen on him, they all knew it was no good. They all said rather gloomily, he's after this blonde in Yorkshire. There was this sense, I think, that her mother wanted more for her than this military man. Some royal observers believe Catherine's mother persuaded her to end her courtship with Andrew so that she'd be free to marry the Duke of Kent. I think that Lady Worsley, once she knew the Duke of Kent was, after Catherine, Prince Eddie was after Catherine, um, I think may well have put a bit of pressure on her, steered her in the direction of Prince Eddie. When the Duke of Kent came on the scene, that really put pay to any kind of chance that Andrew Burnaby Atkins would have had as a possible husband for Catherine. It's often reported that Catherine's parents arranged her first meeting with Edward by inviting him to lunch while his regiment was based nearby. But Catherine had already struck up a friendship with him. She herself has said that uh, they met at a private party in London and uh, they became firm friends. And as a consequence of establishing a firm friendship, the Duke of Kent was a very frequent visitor to Hovingham Hall. Prince Edward was 20 years old and nearly three years younger than Catherine. The army officer was a sports fan with a passion for motor racing. And as the Queen's first cousin, Edward was then eighth in line to the throne. He was regarded as very glamorous. And as Duke of Kent in the 1950s, he was very, very eligible. You know, after Prince Philip, he was, um, he was probably the best known young male royal. So probably quite a catch. Catherine's had big ambitions for her daughter's relationship with Edward, but hadn't reckoned on his mother, the then Duchess of Kent, Princess Marina. She was so dubious about Catherine's suitability as a royal bride, it would take her three years to agree to their engagement. At first, particularly from Princess Marina, after all, when the Duke of Kent, Prince Eddie as he was then, when he first met Catherine, he certainly would have been thought too young to marry. Princess Marina was descended from Greek and Russian royalty and believed monarchy stood apart from everyone. She once described the young queen mother, Elizabeth Bowes Lyon, an earl's daughter, as a common little Scottish girl. Princess Marina wasn't totally sold on the idea of her son marrying the daughter of a local squire. There was one occasion when uh, Edward was with his family and, and other members of the royal family at Sandringham. And uh, Princess Marina he forbade him to leave Sandringham, to go up to Hovingham to see Catherine Worsley. And, of course, he totally ignored her and went. Under the Royal Marriages Act, the Queen's consent was required before any royal under the age of 25 could marry. The young couple waited for Edward to come of age and even agreed to spend a year living apart. While he served in Germany with his regiment, Catherine visited her brother in Canada and travelled in the USA and Mexico. I would imagine the year apart 
went apart from each other was so that they both were certain of what they wanted to do. The separation made them more determined to be together and prove their devotion. In a frank radio interview years later, Catherine acknowledged that they made a wise decision. I went abroad for a while to think it out, and during that time I think it just made us both quite certain that it was the right thing. It made them realise that what they felt for one another was for real. So when, of course, they came back, Princess Marina really had no choice but to give her permission to their marrying. Princess Marina coached Catherine in royal standards of behaviour, and once Catherine was married to Edward, she took on Marina's title to become the new Duchess of Kent. In Catherine's position, would any young woman be ready for the challenges of royal life? Marina had a very, very high profile in the family as the Duchess of Kent. I think to be the new Duchess of Kent, that, that's, a, that's a difficult role. Say so you're a woman of 28 who's married into the royal family, given up your independence, you've got possibly an overbearing mother-in-law, and you've got an, an extensive programme of royal duties as well as being a military wife. I think this is a lot to take on all at once. As Duchess of Kent, Catherine's taxing royal schedule lay ahead of her, but her love of music would never go away and would lead to a secret second life. Catherine being said, well, let me come in and do a singing lesson for you with your class, and I'll just you know, come and help you. After marrying into the royal family in 1961, Catherine, the Yorkshire lass, was now Catherine, Duchess of Kent. Thrown into a high-profile job with a grand title, she embraced the busy schedule of a working royal. I think it's important to realise the Duke and Duchess of Kent were very senior royals. Catherine, along with Margot, the leading female royal of that generation, so she was a bit of a star of the show. In the early years of their marriage, the Duke and Duchess of Kent were a great support to the Queen at a time when her own children were too young to take on duties of their own. So as well as attending major royal events like Trooping the Colour or the State Opening of Parliament, they were also asked to go on royal tours. The Kents represented the Queen overseas many times. One of their earliest visits was to Uganda in 1962 to mark the country's independence from British colonial rule. There's about 45 countries that go through the, that process in the first 30 years of the Queen's reign. Uganda, British Guyana, Barbados. This is a very important representative function. So the Duke and Duchess of Kent were very significant in that. Catherine gave birth to their oldest son, George, a year after their marriage. They joined Edward in Hong Kong for a year during his military service. By 1970, they had two more children. While the Duke had served in Germany and Cyprus, Catherine was mostly in the UK, juggling her busy royal schedule with raising their family. Catherine was effectively an army wife, and I think that meant quite long spells away from her husband, and I think proved very difficult for a couple just starting out in life together. I think if you marry somebody who's in the army with a serious career, you'll get to have periods of separation, and I suppose it does pull eventually, but I think it's probably she would look back on that as quite an important time in her life. Catherine's time was filled with numerous public duties. Though she never overcame her shyness, she kept her common touch and felt right at home with everyday people. They said they didn't know what to do with themselves in the holidays. <laughs> you don't have that problem, do you? <laughs> Nice to see you all. The fact that she was always very cheerful looking and smiling, the fact that she was quite tactile with members of the public, I think really endeared her to the nation at the time. Catherine seemed to hit on the ideal formula for royal conduct. She'd be an inspiration to the royals who followed her example, like Princess Diana. They both understood what it meant coming from the outside and having to try and adjust to a very different way of life. As Diana was to achieve later in her charity work, Catherine kept the focus on the cause rather than herself. The earliest stage of her life, when she had a bigger public profile, it was about bringing the public profile to the charities. Catherine did this. Diana did this. Catherine never sought publicity for herself, but the media and the nation grew to admire her through the annual Wimbledon tennis tournament. Her husband has been president of the All England Club since 1969. She accompanied him for more than three decades and was soon invited to present awards. I always used to observe how humane she was in always comforting the loser and speaking directly and passionately 
trophy to the person who hadn't won the trophy. Catherine's most famous moment of consolation came in 1993, when Jana Novotna was beaten in the women's singles tournament by Steffi Graf. As this famous TV coverage reveals, Novotna burst into tears during the presentation ceremony. The loser had to make do with some royal words of comfort from the Duchess of Kent. Catherine's embrace, watched by millions of viewers, revealed her to be one of the most demonstrative of royals. Although some people might have been surprised to the, the royal family just expressing a natural human emotion, for Catherine that was just the normal natural thing to do, and it was very impressive. In a candid interview years later, Catherine was still modest about her hug with Jana Novotna. You put your arm around her, and Well, she... that's what you do when people are crying. A lot of people at the time said, my word, a member of the royal family. Um, we are quite normal people. <laughs> we do hug people who cry. We don't see there, there, don't stop crying, no. She told people that she was terrified to go on to centre court because of this innate shyness. And she couldn't quite believe that she had attracted a level of fame because of her role on that sporting occasion. Such was Catherine's shyness and modesty, few people knew at the time that she'd already supported another Wimbledon star, Martina Navratilova. The communist regime in her homeland of Czechoslovakia refused to let her family join her in London for the 1978 contest. We don't quite know what the Duchess did, but there were reports that weren't denied that she had lent a hand in making sure that Martina's mother could be there to witness her tennis skills on the court in, in Great Britain. What are your impressions now of uh, this country and of this tournament so far? It's very really nice here, but I'm very glad to, to see uh, my daughter. <laughs> Catherine stopped presenting trophies in 2001. There were also reports of her being displeased with the club after they reprimanded her for trying to bring a non-royal visitor into the royal box. In fact, she was trying to give a treat to the son of a London head teacher, Philip Lawrence, who'd been killed outside his school in a street attack that shocked the nation. Pupils and colleagues gathered today at the Roman Catholic school in London's Maida Vale and paid tribute to their head teacher, who was married with four children. Catherine became very friendly with Philip's widow and also with Philip's son, and she tried to get the son into the royal box, um, and a, which seems rather heartless and rude. She did remain a tennis fan and continued to attend for years and years after that, but just in the stands with everybody else because she went along with friends. Catherine has often found herself going against the royal grain, and in 1993, a chance encounter would lead to a new secret life, and one that would finally allow her to share her love of music. She had met one of the classroom teachers from the Wandsbeck Primary School, and this teacher was explaining to her how nervous the teacher was about teaching music. So Catherine, being Catherine, said, well, let me come in and do a singing lesson for you with your class, and I'll just you know, come and help you. And so for the next 13 years, Catherine commuted to Hull once a week to teach music in a primary school, and later at schools across the country. As this touching documentary reveals, her rapport with children is instant. What's your favorite pop group? Black Eyed Peas. Is this yours? Is that what's yours? I like blue. You like blue? I think everybody likes blue. Westlife? Yeah. <laughs> everybody says that now. Catherine only brought cameras into schools when music education needed attention. Until then, she taught in secret, relying on staff discretion and using the name Mrs. Kent. Nicholas Robinson, her friend and a former head teacher, watched her at work. We travelled up on the train uh, from King's Cross. She was in her tracksuit. Trainers, and what really struck me was at the end of the 50 minutes when she said, Right, um, now children, it's time to finish. Uh, we've come to the end of our singing lesson. They all started saying, Oh no, miss, please, please can we sing that last song again? From my experience of singing, to have children saying, Please, can we have another song after 50 minutes was just really striking. One of the books I read, called Rhinoceros in the Classroom, said something very true, which is that a, a classroom is a room full of learners. I learnt more from these children than I ever ever taught them. She did it with the Queen's blessing, because I think both women understood that this is where Catherine's passion lay, and it wasn't going to interfere with any affairs of state or indeed family matters. The Queen has been so grateful for Catherine's contribution to the royal family, she gave her a special award. Catherine was given the Dame Grand Cross of the Victorian Order, which is in the monarch's personal gift. So I think the Queen has been quite close to Catherine and has been very keen to thank her for her 
service to the royal family through the decades. But Catherine was to pay a heavy price for her constant devotion to duty. The impact of these traumatic events meant that Catherine spiraled into very serious depression. In 2002, whilst Catherine was teaching in Hull, she made a momentous decision, officially withdrawing from her royal duties. Thank you. I really will. Come the mid-90s, as it's now known, she doesn't make a big announcement and sing song about it. By announcing that you're stepping back from something, you draw attention to yourself. So I think that what she did was much more dignified. Age 69, after more than 40 years of loyal public service and now a career as a music teacher, Catherine's decision was fully supported by the royals, but she went a step further in her diversion from the royal path. Catherine did not want to use the title of Royal Highness. And this was Catherine making the point that her royal life was behind her. And therefore, because it was behind her, because she was marching to her own drum now, she didn't need the rank or the title. She wanted to be Catherine. The Duchess revealed this herself in the first interview she gave after giving up her royal title. I don't like being a public figure. I say that very humbly. Um, why, why not? It's my nature. It's where I was born. Um, I like doing things quietly, behind the scenes, achieving things with children. Um, way some of us are built. Catherine had put her longing for privacy to one side in order to fulfill the role she'd taken on. But after four decades of royal duty, she found her moment to step away from the spotlight. She's not the kind of person who stands on ceremony. So I think asking to be released from that title, HRH, would be simply a genuine desire so that there would be no 
barriers between what she's trying to do and between her and, and, and ordinary people. It was an unusual move for a royal, but the Queen gave Catherine her blessing. It is quite significant to say to the Queen that you want to drop the use of your HRH status. There's quite a strong bond between the two women because they're of a similar age, uh, the Queen 94, Catherine 88. And I think the Queen had admiration for the way that uh, Catherine was quietly going about the business of trying to make life better for others. The Duchess's desire to step back from royal life led to unfavourable speculation in the media. She was branded a recluse. Catherine opened up about this in her heartfelt chat with Fiona Bruce. What do you make of that? I mind terribly. You mind terribly? I mind terribly. I mind so much because... <laughs> I'm not. I never was. I'm far too busy, Fiona. Teaching is a, is a very full-time job. I travel to Manchester, I travel to Albra, I travel to London on a regular basis to various things. I look after my family, I cook for my husband. No. I'm not a recluse. That period where people said she had been a recluse, actually she was secretly teaching at a primary school in Hull. The decision to drop her HRH title wasn't the first time she sparked headlines. In 1994, the Duchess caused great controversy when she once again pushed the boundaries of royal protocol, converting to Catholicism. Those close to her say she still retains a genuine affection for the Church of England, but they say she's embarked on what they call a personal spiritual journey. It was very significant, largely, of course, because not since 1701, the Act of Settlement, had a member of the royal family uh, become Catholic. The Duchess arrived for the private ceremony with her husband to the applause of waiting well-wishers. Catherine's decision to ask the Queen to allow her convert was really uh, another example of what a determined woman she was. Despite being head of the Church of England, the Queen approved of Catherine's personal decision, but the move still caused a stir in the press. I think the media regarded it as quite controversial simply because it had never happened before. And this was at a time when, you know, there'd been a lot of press coverage about the Duchess. Converting to Catholicism was a big step. She would not have done it in any kind of way to upset anyone else. It would have been a private matter for her. It's thought that Catherine had turned to Catholicism following tragic events that she faced as a mother. At the start, family life seemed almost idyllic. In the 1960s, I think it was a very happy family. They had the lovely house of Coppins in Ivor, about 15 miles to the west of London, which had been inherited from the Duke and Duchess of Kent, the previous generation. The couple have three children. Eldest child, George, uh, known as the Earl of St Andrews, their middle child, a daughter, uh, Lady Helen Windsor, and their youngest child, Nicholas, Lord Windsor. She seems to have had a desire to have a big family, so, so they had the three children, and, and it seems that she wanted to have, have, have a fourth child. But the years that followed would be some of the worst of her life. Along with losing both of her parents, the dream of having more children ended in tragedy. In 1975, at the age of 40, she became pregnant with her fourth child, but very sadly, she contracted German measles. And of course, German measles in the first trimester can have the most devastating effect. And she had a termination. And I don't think she ever really quite forgave herself for that. But at the time, it seemed absolutely the right thing to do. Although the decision was medically advised, it's said to have plagued Catherine ever since. And in 1977, two years after the termination, tragedy struck once more. At 44, she conceived at birth. After 36 hours struggling to keep him alive, this baby died. And it devastated her. This triggered for Catherine the start of the most terrible period of depression, leading to being admitted to the King Edward VII Hospital. She was there in the hospital for seven weeks. Catherine had hurled herself back into royal duty, which had serious consequences. Some said it was nervous exhaustion. Others talked about a nervous breakdown. Catherine, by her own admission, was suffering from depression at the time. Catherine later took another groundbreaking step for a royal, publicly opening up about the trauma of losing children and her personal 
battle with mental health issues. Royals weren't open about their mental health as we're used to them being now, with the likes of Prince William and Prince Harry talking about their Heads Together charitable initiative. Back then, it was unheard of, really, for royals to be that revelatory about their own innermost feelings. Catherine gave very few interviews, and then only on subjects about which she both felt deeply and she felt would be of significance and use to members of the public who might have suffered in the same way. That did make Catherine appear to be somebody who was perhaps more relatable than the average royal, somebody who seemed human, very much one of us rather than being perhaps one of them. In addition to the loss that the couple suffered, the Duchess also battled health issues for most of her adult life. It was first said that she was suffering from Epstein-Barr virus, then ME, before it seemed to be confirmed that it was celiac disease that she was suffering from. But um, before, of course, that they'd actually got to that, she had been suffering quite considerably from health problems. None of that was apparent at the time when she was cheerfully giving the prizes at Wimbledon, carrying out a huge programme of public engagements. Despite the toll it took on her health, Catherine remained determined to measure up to royal expectations in a world where duty comes before all else. It epitomizes the essence of this determined woman. You know, she refers to herself as a perfectionist, and she says, I'm a 24-hour person. Since I've known Catherine over the 20 years, she has always worked tirelessly. And I know when she was teaching East Hull, that over the 13 years that she was teaching there, I think she only missed two days. Despite Catherine's personal struggles, her primary focus seems to be helping others. Alongside being a working royal, a teacher and a mother, a large part of Catherine's life has been dedicated to charity. She marries into the royal family, and that gives her a voice and an ability to make a difference. It's, it's not a crazy dream, it's, it, it's a possibility. I really do believe we can actually do this. She has served as the patron, president or board member of more than a hundred charities. The Duchess's visit is to highlight the work of VSO volunteers by raising their profile in Macedonia and helping trade government and people that those with mental and physical problems should not be stigmatised. With Catherine, the charities that were closest to her heart always seem to be music, children and the elderly. One especially uh, close to her heart was Helen House in Oxfordshire, their home for terminally ill children, and she was a great presence there. I learnt, I suppose after I've been here four or five times, it suddenly came to me how tears and smiles walk side by side. I think the Duchess of Kent was very much the kind of royal that didn't just want to be on a letterhead. She actually wanted to go and witness the work being carried out by charities firsthand, and even at times take part in it herself. For some years, Catherine went as a volunteer on pilgrimage to Lourdes in France, getting up at six o'clock in the morning, going to the hospital, helping to bathe and dress one of the pilgrims, or helping to feed them, sitting with them, having a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, or just chatting to them. After she took on her role as patron of the Samaritans, the Duchess insisted on becoming a Samaritan herself, personally taking calls from those in need. She worked for them as a volunteer for many, many years, and she was always known as Kate. And, of course, nobody knew who they were talking to. I remember I said to her, how do you cope if somebody rings up and says, I want to die? What do you say? And she replied, you have to cut everything else out and focus solely on trying to help that person. Here's a woman who's led a life of the most unimaginable wealth and privilege, and yet has managed to retain the common touch. She's still that golden-haired lass from Yorkshire, you know, who, who married the royal prince. Whilst Catherine directed the spotlight onto her changes, what many didn't realize is that her marriage to the Duke of Kent was under great strain and had been for some time. Catherine and Edward were quite different people with very different interests. And though they were very much in love and had a loving family life, this put a strain on their relationship. And then in the 1970s, after the loss of not one, but two children and Catherine's serious depression. 
Catherine needed her husband to be there for her. Edward was raised as a royal. He was part of the royal family. With the repression that that can bring, with the restrictions that that can bring, Edward wasn't able to deliver. It's even thought at the time that the couple were considering divorce. I'm told that Catherine had thought about seeking a divorce, but certainly the Duke of Kent promised the Queen that there wouldn't be a divorce. Divorce was still frowned upon by the Church of England, and as its head, the Queen could not have supported such a controversial decision. Catherine stuck very closely to doing the right thing. She would never have dreamt of doing anything that she felt the Queen would disapprove of. She did not allow any marital discord to affect her relationship either with the royal family or with the life of service she had chosen. Edward and Catherine stayed together, and so whilst they would still undertake engagements together, they began drifting apart and would lead pretty much their own separate lives. When newcomer Diana faced similar struggles in her royal marriage, an unlikely friendship developed. She understood Diana's problems. She could see the privilege, but also the pain. Throughout her royal life, the Duchess of Kent was tested by the unique demands of the royal relationship. Decades later, Princess Diana would experience many of the same struggles. You know, I think she could see a lot of herself in Diana. And later on, when they came to, you know, recite together in Kensington Palace, they became very close friends. She advised Diana at critical moments of her life on how to handle the pressures in her marriage. Despite the age gap of almost 30 years, Catherine and Diana formed a unique friendship that lasted until Diana's death. Catherine and Princess Diana went through a certain number of the same experiences. Uh, they both suffered immense grief. They both found themselves isolated at times. They both had to overcome mental difficulties. And they both had that quality of warmth and empathy with people. They were both free spirits, both wanting to respect the queen and their royal role, but equally perhaps wanting to break free and operate a little differently in the royal sphere. Catherine admitted in a, a media interview years later that she understood Diana's problems and sympathized with them because she could see uh, the privilege, but also the pain. And so I think Catherine did put an arm around Diana and, and, and try and help her through some very tough times. Catherine knew too much 
repel the rigor of royal life. Now aged 88, with her royal duties and her HRH title behind her, Catherine, Duchess of Kent, seems to be living a life away from royal grandeur. And aside from the weddings of Harry and William, over the last 19 years, Catherine has rarely been seen in public. She's been able to pick and choose you know, the few royal events that, that she attends, you know, big weddings, occasionally trooping the colour, anything that's special for the Queen, with whom I think she has a close relationship. The Duke and Duchess of Kent are lucky enough to be, to be grandparents to ten children, so that must be a rather lovely phase in life, that she's able to spend time with the grandchildren. It's often interesting to see royals who are now in their 80s being described as sort of having stepped back from age. Even at nearly 90, Catherine is committed to public duty. In 2004, rather than winding down after retiring from royal life, Catherine co-founded a music charity, Future Talent. I know she's patron and president of many, many um, organisations and charities, but this particular charity it is her own vision. It's her baby. Having taught now for 12 years, as you say, in East Hull, and being incredibly frustrated by, I would say, at least 20 children in 12 years who had potential to reach the very, very top in music, and immensely frustrated that I can't find a route forward for them. What I want to do is try to bridge this enormous divide. Why shouldn't all children have equal opportunities in music? Why not? That's what Future Talent wants to do. It was this attempt to harness the power of music and trying to inspire confidence in youngsters. And I think that reflects her own experience, somebody who loved music but was intrinsically a shy person, being put in a position because of her marriage where she had to face the public and do so with a degree of confidence that perhaps she was given by her own musical performances and her love for music in general. The charity has recruited ambassadors such as Dame Judi Dench and Sting and Catherine has organized concerts at Buckingham Palace and Windsor Castle for the young musicians. Right from the beginning, Catherine would go into the office two or three times a week and we'd be writing letters and making phone calls. At an age when most people would be forgiven for putting their feet up and taking it easy, she just keeps going on. Spanning seven decades, the Duke and Duchess's marriage has not been without its difficulties. But after living largely separate lives, in 2013, Catherine moved back into their home, Wren House, in Kensington Palace, after Edward suffered a stroke. It's rumoured that the two are closer now than they have ever been before. But this is the quintessential Catherine, giving support and succour when she feels it's needed, whether to her husband, who is now ailing, or in the past to uh, the weeping Jana Novotna in Wimbledon. The Duchess is still close with her royal relatives and her neighbors at Kensington Palace include William and Kate. It's a family community, so that's rather lovely that they're still integral members of the royal family. I'm sure that you know, occasionally they would see, see the queen. Catherine Worsley married into the royal family against all the odds and has not only survived, but has lived royal life on her own terms. She's transformed what it means to be a royal, the fact that she became a Catholic, which is a song and dance about it, the fact that she taught quietly in a school. I don't think we have any examples of any other royals that have been able to be that free-spirited and independently minded, while at the same time remaining within the royal fold and not offending anyone by their own desire to do things a little differently. The Duchess has proved that you don't need to do everything the conventional way to lead a life devoted to public service. She has spent most of her life trying to help other people, and that service is what the monarchy... The one at York Minster was a royal first. Uh, nobody from the royal family had been married there in over 600 years. And this was very much a nod to Catherine's Yorkshire roots. She's very proud of the fact she comes from Yorkshire and from the north. The Queen and her family travelled up on a special train for the landmark event, while the young Princess Anne was among Catherine's bridesmaids. The local media dubbed this as the White Rose Wedding, and indeed it was. Even uh, the Queen had uh, the White Rose of York as part of a tribute to the setting. Just under 12 million viewers tuned in to watch the afternoon ceremony. 
and it was one of the highest rating programs of the week in half the nation's homes at a time when the UK had take me Edward to my wedded husband to my wedded husband was just one small hitch not seen on camera as the newly married couple made their exit after they'd signed the registers the veil got caught on the step of the altar and she felt it pull and stood absolutely still until it was released otherwise the veil would have come off and uh, the diamond bando tiara that she was wearing that had once belonged to queen mary would have come crashing to the floor no doubt is composed and smiling unruffled even when her train gets caught up catherine made her mark from the word go she was the first untitled woman to marry into the royal family for more than a century as this 1961 tabloid reveals, it was front page news that the Duke of Kent was to marry a Yorkshire lass. It did break with tradition, this idea that although she was the daughter of a baronet, that she wasn't royal herself. And that was breaking boundaries and um, changing things. She's definitely upper class. She had no title, but her, her parents had a title and it was clearly a love match. And she was quite clearly a sweet girl. And that was how she was portrayed. Marrying into the firm had not been Catherine's long-term ambition, but she went on to embrace the royal family on her terms. From an early age, her biggest passion was music, as she explained